everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here. I'm Eric Engineer from S3 Ventures and very excited uh, to be on this panel today. Uh, the Texas Startup Fundraising in 2021. It's been a record breaking year. Uh, this is actually our third year doing this panel and I just wanted to thank uh, the hardworking volunteers at Austin Startup Week and everyone at Capital Factory for inviting us again. Uh, every year has been a great discussion and I'm hoping that'll be the same this year. Unfortunately, we can't do it in person. It's all virtual. Uh, but uh, we hope that you'll enjoy today's session. In terms of an agenda, um, we're going to start with some intros. So I have this great group here of local VCs that are going to give you a little bit of background on themselves and their firms, and then I will do the same. And then we'll spend about 10 minutes. I'm going to rush through a bunch of slides on, on data, uh, just some really interesting data. Uh, like I said, we've broken many records in Texas and in Austin, and it's really exciting to see. So we'll look at that. And then we'll get into some uh, a panel discussion where we'll talk about the data. We'll talk about other um, trends that we're seeing in the marketplace. So that's how we'll run the business, uh, run, run our business today. It's about 45 minutes uh, total. So uh, let's start with the introductions. I'll just go with the, the folks on the slide here. Uh, Tom, do you, you want to start? Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Tom Ball. I'm the co-founder of Next Coast Ventures. I moved to Austin from California about 16 years ago. Uh, before I came to Austin, I had started a few companies out there after graduating from Stanford, moved to Austin to join Austin Ventures, where I spent just over 10 years. Uh, we started Next Coast in 2016 uh, and have raised two funds so far. Uh, first fund was a $90 million fund, which we raised in 2016, raised uh, Another fund in 2019, which was a $130 million fund. Uh, strategy for us is, you know, we call it Next Coast because we like to invest in the Next Coast. It was a good timing thing to name that before the pandemic. Uh, about 60 to 70% of what we do is in Texas. We have deals in Chicago, Miami, Utah, et cetera. Um, and then from a kind of sector and stage perspective, we don't consider ourselves really sectorial. We're more thematic. Um, things like the future of work, self-health care, hacking, um, but it all boils down to pretty much software and internet and tech-enabled services that we invest in. And then stage or seed to what you used to call Series B, uh, although I think the alphabet's gotten a little scrambled, but yeah, traditional seed to Series B. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, Kip, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, Kip McClenahan, Silverton Partners. Um, Silverton is one of the more active early stage venture capitalists in Austin. I've been there, gosh, over a decade now. Um, we're investing out of our sixth fund. Uh, Silverton's fund size tends to be in the 120 range, uh, plus or minus a bit. Um, we'll be raising a, another fund here in the next year or two, so uh, we'll continue that that pace. Uh, we like to be uh, you know, early on in your traditional seed or Series A Um you know, our initial check size tends to be between, you know, a million or two up to four or five. Um, we uh, are, are very active. We like to take board seats, uh, happy to lead, happy to syndicate. Um, we also have a, a predominantly Austin focus. Uh, we say it's about 75% focused regionally here and then about 25% uh, where we have uh, our network stretch into uh, other geos like Salt Lake City or New York. Thanks, Kip. Uh, Carrie, you're next on the screen here for me. Great. Well, Tom started with when he moved here, and I know mine was precisely 13 years ago because I moved here the Thursday before ACL in 2008. <laughs> um, we at True Wealth Ventures are also investing um, in seed stage companies. Uh, we are investing out of our second fund, which is a target $30 million fund. And we invest explicitly in women-led companies uh, that are improving human and or environmental health. So we're an impact fund, but you know, expecting top tier returns because of that, because of the demand for those markets. And we tend to write first checks of up to a million dollars. Um, similarly, you know, active and we prefer to lead and take board seats, but we'll syndicate. Um, we did our last two deals in Dallas and Austin, but we do invest across the country. Um, we'd love to do more deals in Texas. I think we have four total now um, out of our 13 are in this region. Great. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, Krishna? Thank you. I'm uh, Krishna Srinivasan, uh, co-founder of uh, Live Oak Venture Partners. I've been in town since the beginning of 2000. 
when I came here to join Austin Ventures. I spent a decade at Austin Ventures and then uh, founded uh, Live Oak in 2012 uh, with our first investments began in 2013. Uh, we had a uh, today, we have invested a couple of funds now in the 100, and change, $100 million and change range. Uh, we are uh, 100% focused on Texas-based companies, uh, like to invest in uh, seed, Series A's, um, most typically lead and uh, co-lead th these investments. We are a full lifecycle investor, which means we start with a $1.5 to $4 million first check and then um, stay active and engage and invest across multiple rounds of the company, investing <clears throat> six to $10 million for the life cycle. Uh, from a sector perspective, we are very much multi-sector uh, companies across the spectrum from, uh, 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 from uh, you know, anything that's tech and tech-enabled services across our industries. Um, and uh, I think that's pretty much it. Thank you, Krishna. And then real quick on myself, um, this is my second go round in Austin. I, I came here in 2001 um, to join Trilogy Software, which was a fast growing startup during the dot-com bubble here, and then um, moved away, uh, moved, lived all over the country, and then came back in 2008 to Dallas, where I joined Seven Rosen Funds, which was a large venture capital firm there at the time. Uh, landed up joining a portfolio company in Voto, becoming the CEO, uh, grew that and sold it in 18. S3 Ventures was a investor in that company. So they were uh, my partners, Charlie and Brian, were kind enough to ask me to join at that time. And so I've been here about three years. S3 um, is a, we're on our sixth fund. It's a $200 million fund. We do seed series A and series B investing. So as little as 500K to $10 million to, to lead around. And then uh, we like to follow on for the life of a company. We can put up to 20 million in, into a company. Uh, we do mostly B2B software, but we've also done some consumer digital experiences. We've also done some healthcare tech, including med devices. And then lastly, I'd say we're pretty unique in that we have a single LP. Uh, so that allows us to be a little bit more patient uh, in terms of our investing. All right. Well, uh, that's us. I am going to jump next to the uh, fundraising data. I'm going to rush through these because I think the, the most interesting stuff is the conversation. But I do think this data is, is really interesting and exciting. And, and I hope all of you guys... Um, We'll, we'll get something out of it. Uh, first of all, we thought I'd start with some kind of just national numbers. So I, I know there's a lot on this just slide. So just to kind of help orient you, uh, the bars are the capital do uh, capital investments or dollars invested, and the line is the number of deals in thousands. And so you can see, you know, we're going back to 2006 here, that's just been steadily increasing uh, year over year. Um, and this is the U.S. data. But the most interesting thing here is that we're just looking at the first half of 21 and we're pretty much almost matched where we were in 20 in terms of dollars. And you can kind of extrapolate from there that uh, we're going to definitely going to be even on the count side. So 21 is definitely going to be um, a record year that's going to just blow past things and almost nearly double uh, where we were uh, last year. So just super exciting, very, very interesting time in the market, um, which we'll talk about um, as a panel. In terms of the effects of something like this happening. Uh, when you kind of look at like what's driving that, uh, you know, we thought this data looking at quarterly and in chunks is kind of interesting. So here again, the bars are the dollars invested, the lines are the number of deals. And while the number of deals have gone up, it's clearly the total dollars that have shot up more. And when you kind of do the math, it's really driven by the size of the deals or the size of the rounds. So, we've, you know, we were at $8 million a deal in 16 and 17, 12 million in 18, 19, 20 in that period. And suddenly there's this step up where now just in the first half of 21, the average deal size is 21 million per deal. A lot of that is driven by these really large growth rounds at the, uh, in later stages. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about kind of dissecting things in a little bit more detail later. But just at, as, as a whole, you can see that just round sizes are growing. Um, in terms of Texas trends, um, you know, if you, you, we have to be kind of living under a rock to not see all this happening, but it's just been really impressive and really exciting to see tens of thousands of jobs, technology jobs moving here as, as big tech keeps planning, you know, either headquarters or second or third offices in Austin, Dallas, and Houston. Uh, you can see it's kind of been across the state. So a lot of talented people, you know, I know at S3 we're super pumped and we're seeing entrepreneurs which is incredible profiles uh, now, uh, just given, given this shift. 
And, um, you know, this was some interesting data from census data. Unfortunately, the, the latest census data that we could pull on, on migrations was 2019. So I'm sure this has just accelerated since then. But you can see that most of this migration or the largest net migration flow in the country, when you look at it between states, is, be, is from California to Texas. And I think we've all seen that. We probably all know people from California that we've met uh, in our neighborhoods and things like that that's, that they've moved in. And that's also obviously affected the housing market. We've all seen the prices go through the roof and this line graph kind of gives you a, a sense of the magnitude there where Austin in particular is outpacing the growth uh, across the, the US in terms of pricing. Uh, and then, you know, uh, you know, we update this slide every time we do this presentation and uh, I think it's like doubled year over year. <laughs> and so now we're about, our, at our estimates, about 25 billion in active capital that is that has a base here in Austin of some sort. In some cases, these are local firms like the folks that are here on this panel and ourselves, but also a lot of transplants, people either setting up their primary location here in Texas or having a second or third office here in Austin with a partner moving here. So it's super exciting time that the group on the right there, the, the rightmost column is all the folks that I believe are kind of new within the last 12 to 18 months. I'm sure I'm missing some names. Uh, from this, I was always nervous. I'm always nervous to put this slide together because I'm going to piss someone off <laughs> by leaving them off. But, uh, you know, this is, just gives you a sense of how things have exploded. Uh, when we talk about uh, with the panel, you know, some folks like myself, I was at Seven Rosen Funds, but other folks on this panel here were at Austin Ventures way before me, even in, in this ecosystem and can talk about how things have changed so dramatically. Uh, and then, um, you know, where does Texas fall on, on the national scale? So if we just look at the first half of 21 uh, and we think about Texas as a single market uh, and each of the other states as their own markets, uh, we're number four right now. So uh, in the first half, we've done just over four billion in, in deals across 334 deals. So that's very exciting. Uh, you can see, obviously, California is a league of its own. Uh, and then it's New York and, and Massachusetts, which, um, you know, are still pretty sizable um, numbers relative to Texas, but I, I'd love to always share with people that when, when I entered venture capital in 2008, it was really Boston and, and Silicon Valley. New York was not on the map. LA was not on the map. And, you know, a lot can change in 10 years. So I firmly believe Texas has a shot at being, you know, at those levels that New York and Massachusetts are. And I'm sure everyone here on the panel uh, feel the same. Um, and then this is uh, just to look at the Texas data in particular. So the, the, the light blue is Austin and then the darker gray is the rest of Texas. And then we kind of extrapolated a little bit with the gray dots there. And what you can see here is that uh, we're well on our pace uh, to surpass uh, what we did last year. But what's also interesting is we went back in time and looked at where we were at our peak all time uh, as a state. And it really goes back, you have to go all the way back to 2000 to the, the peak of the dot-com bubble. And it looks like we're gonna we're gonna surpass that. So it looks like we are gonna now enter record territory, uh, both um, as clearly in Austin because we're almost there, uh, but even as a state uh, of Texas. And then uh, we did a little bit of digging here to understand it by um, round. So we looked at the early stage investing. Most of the folks on this panel are doing seed A and B, as you heard, and um, you can see that the the number of deals. Um, is, is, is definitely going up, uh, but especially um, at the later, you know, when you look on, on the B side, um, it's, it's the dollars have gone up, but the, the numbers have been roughly the same. So it's again, pointing to this trend, which I'm gonna go to next here, which is it's the round sizes primarily that are driving a lot of this growth. And I think we've all experienced this as investors, entrepreneurs have seen this too, where we're seeing larger rounds the seeds have grown uh, by 93% over the last five years. A's have grown by 42%. And the B's in particular, as I think Tom made an allusion, what used to be called the Series B. It's very confusing now in terms of the, the, the naming here, but the B's are getting quite large compared to what they used to be. So, uh, and then lastly, I, I love showing this one. Uh, this is, you know, the fact that we, you know, we're, we're kind of doing some incredible things here locally. So, um, there have already been just this year two locally backed IPOs uh, in Alchemy and Disco, uh, backed by S3 Ventures, Wild Basin, and, and Live Oak. And then we have just increasing number of unicorns uh, being minted, uh, you know, four in the in the last two years, which is you know much higher than what we had historically, as you can see. 
And you know, I think um, you know, just just really great representation uh, in terms of the local firms and all the amazing companies uh, that are being um, built here and really starting to scale here, which is which is really exciting to see. So uh, I, that's it in terms of the slides. I really wanted to now kind of open it up to the panel for some discussion here. So I'm going to stop sharing. Hopefully this works. And uh, everyone can still there with me. Great. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, you know, I thought I'd start by asking all of you, um, you know, wh what, did, what stood out to you in that data? You know, what rings true? What maybe is missing um, from, from what you saw there? Um, uh, Carrie, yeah. uh, did you, do you have a thought there? Yeah, just the one thing I wanted to point out, which is, I guess, depressing but pragmatic to know, is that despite the increase in attention to women-led companies, um, because that's what we focus on, the data actually shows that it's at an all-time low in terms of the percentage. So, you know, for those of you who've been following, they've been measuring it for, you know, five to ten years, depending on what source you look at, and it's been hovering around two to three percent, and it hit an all-time low of 1.8 percent. <laughs> during the pandemic and it's hovering around 1.9. So it, you know, the dollars are growing with all the dollar, you know, growth that Eric shared, but um, the percentage of women getting funded is not much better. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, even more true of minorities. So I just call that out to say, if you are a woman entrepreneur or a minority entrepreneur, it still requires more hustle and strategy, et cetera. And maybe we'll talk to some of those things later. And Carrie, is that on a percentage basis or on a dollar basis? Percentage basis. Percentage basis. Okay, got it, interesting. Yeah, I mean, the thing I liked about the data that I think is is uh, positive is you look at where Austin fits, and we're top five, so number four is a good place to be. If you look at the top three, as you pointed out, it's it's like two thirds of the capital still for the first half of the year. It's 100 billion of the 150 billion, and you know, fourth place is less than 10 percent of the remaining. So. Um, Obviously, uh, you know, the California and New York and Boston are are much larger, but I think that's just opportunity for us. And as you said, Eric, like, you know, the last 10 years ago, if you looked at that, it wasn't that that uh, that equal between those three markets in the top three. So while we're at four point two billion, I think we're still, as my real estate friends say, we're still in the very early innings of this, it feels like. Um, so I think that's uh, a great thing for us. And the. Second, another element of it is, I think, you know, maybe it's the, what, what, what Tom's reflecting to, I think the rate of ascendancy for us seems just much greater compared to the rest of the country here. We might just be a tad bigger than, I think it was Illinois, if I'm not mistaken, your list. But I, I feel like the amount of, uh, maybe it, it's the press, it's the general attention being paid to this market from large companies, from from entrepreneurs or moving from other parts of the, of, of the country here, um, we get uh, a disproportionate level of uh, attention in the market, which is of course translating to uh, a, a kind of a virtuous cycle here of uh, migration, not just of talent, but also of capital that's happening here. Um, our companies are getting discovered much more aggressively for follow-on financing rounds here compared to let's say a company in uh, Illinois, uh, right, which is in the same league. And, 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 you know, and uh, uh, so later rounds of financing are, are more frictionless compared to before and many other positive benefits. So the rate of change here is dramatically better compared to many of the other markets. Right. And your thoughts, Kip, did you have anything to add there? Or? No, I mean, I, I think they said it right. Um, I think it's, it's easier when you're starting from smaller numbers to show greater you know, percentage gains. And I think we're enjoying some of that. But ultimately... Yeah, we've seen uh, yeah the pace accelerate in everything. Um, rate of talent coming to town, rate of quality deals that we're seeing, uh, the pace at which they're able to actually scale and scale the business for real, and then raise money behind that. So um, yeah, it's a uh, Texas in general, Austin in particular. It's a it's as uh, wild and woolly as we've ever seen. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so how is this changing? How you guys are investing? I know at, at S3, it, 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 we tend to take a step back sometimes and say, whoa, what's, what's happening here? To take, you know, taking stock of, of, the, of the dynamism uh, and, and just how things have changed. Uh, I'm curious how you guys are, you know, approach the market or think about deals and, and work with entrepreneurs. Has it changed quite a bit uh, in the, let's say, five years and then the last two years? Because I think, like you said, it's been accelerating and things are changing faster. Any thoughts there? 
I guess my input on that would be more related to just the change in the last two years of COVID and because mm -hmm. of the accessibility of being able to hop on a Zoom and that being now, you know, sort of a suitable way to do a first screen and being able to get on online conferences and quickly kind of watch the startup competition or do the one-on-ones that our deal flow has been frankly sort of insane um, at the top of the funnel, um, which has been great um, in terms of efficiency. You know, you're not flying to a conference, you're not going to all these meetings, you can do a lot more, but it makes it actually really hard to process. Um, and, you know, I'll be curious to see how that plays out over time with all of us so desperate to see people in, in real life. Um, but I feel like we've looked at way more deals in the last two years, just related to the online um, mm. flexibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, Kip, Kip said it perfectly, right? It's like it's better than it's ever been and it's faster than it's ever been. Yeah. I think it's it's it, to Carrie's point, it's quantity is off the hook. I mean, there's so many deals to look at now. Um, quality is is better as well uh, on a broad base. You know, number of quality deals is better. Um, I'm not sure percent of quality deals has gone up. Um, it's you know, there's a noise factor with quantity growing so fast. But as far as how it impacts us, I mean, it's, you know, higher velocity, faster decisions. Uh, as a former entrepreneur, I think it's better for the entrepreneurs to have all those continuing growing sources of capital in the market. Uh, th I think the good news is, is it hasn't necessarily, I mean, obviously we've had inflationary things on round, uh, round sizes and round prices, but it, it hasn't, you know, we haven't accelerated as fast as the coast by any means. So yeah, I think it's still a true. very healthy market. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say, you know, just to add to that, um, you know, it was about a year ago that, uh, you know, at least at a, from a Silverton perspective, that we started realizing that by and large, and certainly in the majority of the portfolio, <clears throat> you know, we had tailwinds versus headwinds relative to some of the efficiencies around and what we we're just talking about from a velocity perspective, from an efficiency perspective, Zoom works work at home didn't destroy, you know, the cultures or, or productivity, um, you know, from, a, you know, March, April through about now, maybe a little bit earlier. I think there was a, um, you know, there's some concern that uh, we didn't know what sort of environment we were getting into. And about now, a year ago, um, at least, you know, at, at Silverton, we looked around and we're like, my gosh, we actually uh, see a portfolio performing on the whole significantly better. And I think a lot of that has carried forward. Um, I think there's efficiencies to get um, realized now in terms of lack of travel, uh, efficiency of meeting, pace of uh, being able to communicate uh, from a company perspective and interpersonally um, that I probably wouldn't have necessarily predicted back at the beginning of the whole COVID cycle. But um, yeah, I think that lends itself dramatically to the velocity uh, that we're seeing right now. And we've all become much more pragmatic about distributed teams. You know, maybe some of us were in the old purist model of you have to locate companies under one roof. That just creates a lot more efficiencies. I think it absolutely creates more efficiencies, no doubt about it. But uh, large companies have demonstrated how they can be incredibly successful on a remote operating basis. So we, th that level of that's given us the comfort that when you make our early stage bets, we can, uh, uh, you know, you'd like to see some critical mass together, but it can certainly be quite distributed for this to be successful and effective. Um, and, and that aperture has widened for us as we look at newer companies. Uh, one thing we've noticed is uh, the speed of some of the rounds and how they're coming together. I'm curious if, if you guys see that and how you think about that pros and cons <laughs> it's it's yes its speed has increased uh it's it's literally we had a deal where we met with an entrepreneur for the first time it's like well, where are you at in the fundraising process it's like oh you're our first meeting just getting going you know had the meeting it's like okay we'll follow up the next week it's like oh i signed a term sheet it's like wow that did not used to happen yeah. um and uh they didn't sign a term sheet with anybody on this call so i'm not mad at anybody here but um this is uh that has certainly happened uh and again, as a former entrepreneur, I think that's great. I think you got to be careful that you don't go too fast, though. Yeah, I agree with that. We, we see the same thing. I think what it what it causes, yeah, every firm, I think, has their own version of discipline uh, and perspective on 
markets like this. And if you've been doing it long enough, you've seen cycles, um, you know, that this feels like a bit of a frothy period of time um, in terms of the pacing, in terms of the valuation, in terms of the size of the round. Uh, you know, if you've done it long enough, you've seen a couple of these where it goes, you know, it goes full cycle and the music stops at some point. Um, I think if you're in the market, if you're a firm that's actually wanting to do deals, there is some reconciliation that you have to do in terms of willing to willing to participate at that particular pace, uh, perhaps willing to participate at prices that are not historically where you think, uh, you know, seems rational relative to where the company's stage and state happens to be. But uh, you can't necessarily sit on your <clears throat> sit on your thumbs on the sideline. Um, and you certainly can't enjoy the the rewards of the other end of the market, the exit market, which is absolutely benefiting from the same sort of uh, dynamism that exists in the early stages uh, without participating on both sides. In other words, you can't take, you know, you can't enjoy all the exits that are happening and and then begrudge the pace and timing and price of the early stage. And so, you know, we have hard discussions, but ultimately uh, we're a firm that wants to and is in market. And so that means you've got to take a step forward and uh, maybe apply a little bit of additional new sort of discipline. But you can't uh, you can't sit there and, and, you know, behave as you have behaved in the past and expect to uh, participate in a market as, as interesting as this one is. Do you guys find yourselves coming in earlier? Yeah, you know, well, we've um, always come in quite early um, across the spectrum, you know, homeward backed it with one entrepreneur company that was, and Disco was formed at the time of inception along with our check into the company, et cetera, as well. But, but having said that, I think this definitely forces all to come in a little earlier here uh, because the moment the companies pick up some traction, there is uh, that same phenomenon that Tom's talking about with uh, um, lots and lots of source of capital, not just firms. You know, there are lots of these super angels, individuals who have done extremely well in the last two or three years, especially in the West Coast, who are willing to come in and write checks at phenomenal valuation these businesses. Definitely see that dynamic quite a bit. So I think it all forces all to just get earlier um, in, in these companies. Certainly you've seen a, a trend of uh, the bigger later stage firms coming downstream more. I, I, you know, I think everybody on this call is a pretty early stage investor and always has been. So I don't, you know, I don't know how much earlier we could go unless you start doing these pre-seed or pre pre seed or whatever the 18 flavors of seed are now. Um, but I don't know how we could go earlier. I think to Krishna's point, when you see the growth equity firms, it's like, oh, we used to have an ARR threshold of 10 million. Now it's 5 million. And, you know, and I talked to one the other day and it's like, and eh, we'd probably go to three if it was a great company. So, so I think we see that. I frankly, you know, I, I think that's an interesting dynamic in the market. Um, and, you know, you'll ask this question later, I'm sure. But I think the, for the entrepreneurs, they got to decide who they want to work with at that stage and who can add the most value and who's the right yep. partner at that stage. I think that's a great point. You know, one, one thing I'd throw out there is yeah, I'm <clears throat> within a firm. I suspect the, the dynamic exists uh, in a lot of cases. I think um, you have partners that are, um, you know, have our stage and state. Uh, there's particular stages and states that they prefer. Um, yeah, I think having been in the Austin market as long as we have, we've got had the um, fortune to be able to work with a bunch of teams um, repeatedly. And in many of those cases, uh, we're able to make a team bet, uh, you know, before there's any revenue. And I think that that's a, that's a luxury. Uh, it doesn't happen all the time, but I do think that um, the ability to leverage relationships and, and, you know, experienced entrepreneurs to go, you know, even a, a notch earlier is something that, uh, you know, is an opportunity. I think you do need a little bit of pattern that you can match there, whether that's team or or a little bit of uh, you know market knowledge or something else. But I think that is uh, not typical. But I wouldn't be surprised if everybody's pushed a bit in that direction. Yeah, you know, one thing that has made us feel a little bit more comfortable with this is also just the the talent that has come into the state um, that helps you get a little bit more comfortable with coming in earlier. 
you know, um, you know, I think a lot of the pr technology problems and things that people face sometimes are happening in the Googles or the Facebooks that are pushing the envelope in terms of scale or doing something new for the first time. And those engineers and those, those, those folks that worked on that are now sometimes now are in Texas versus living in Silicon Valley and they're coming and starting those businesses. And we've seen that pattern, whether it's an Apple employee or an Uber employee recently, you know, you know, that are doing that, that are here now. Uh, yeah. So there's, I, I there's, no question, that part. there's no question the talent pool has gotten deeper. I think all of us as early stage investors would would say that we pride ourselves on the ability to add some of that talent um, you know, into companies at the right time uh, for the right role. You know, and, and I think that's part of what the job is as an early stage investor. Um, yeah, I, I, I believe that that's gotten easier. Um, I think we've got more of a Rolodex to pull from. Uh, and that expands every day. But ultimately, I think that's been that's been on the agenda for everybody on this call for a long time. I just think it's gotten a, a notch easier with the influx of talent and the ability for some of these folks to have gone through the system a couple of times. Um, you know, the, it is reinforcing itself and feeding back in a very positive way. So it's a you know, water levels rising as far as that goes. I think that's a really important dynamic that's underway in this market. And of course, not only are we seeing talent come in and some of the data you have, uh, Eric, is the entire uh, ecosystem here of locally grown talent has just gotten significantly better. We have companies going public, we have companies achieving scale to go raise you know, big rounds of financing. Um, not just this year, right? If you take into consideration last year, you know, BigCommerce went public last year and, 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 and so on and so on. And if you go the last five years, there has been a pretty healthy slug of impressive companies that have gone public and created real critical mass. So you are seeing that uh, those people who have been through those companies have been through the, are ex much more experienced. So the talent pool of just locally grown, um, you know, talent here is just, uh, is significantly better than before. And we are all absolutely fabulous beneficiaries of that talent, of, of, the, of that, of that up-leveling of talent. Great. And it, and it bears mentioning that the folks that are regionally focused, this is an especially important dynamic, right? Um, you know, or an argument to be regionally focused because <laughs> um, it, it definitely, um, it definitely is getting stronger. And, and you talked about a five-year look back versus a two-year look back. Exactly. Um, I can remember a 10-year look back where, um, you know, almost universally, if you're looking for top tier VP or above talent, that was a search and you're, and you're looking outside of Texas, outside of Austin to try to fill that. That line has trended dramatically down. And, and I don't know the last time we felt necessary, it felt it necessary to absolutely find somebody outside of Austin versus not having at least a few at bats uh, with the talent pool here. Great. Um, well, thanks for that. Uh, I, I wanted to shift gears a little bit because I wanted to also make sure we had the opportunity to um, just talk about um, just kind of general tips that we might have for entrepreneurs um, that are maybe raising venture for the first time, um, and maybe not as familiar <laughs> with, you know, what, what goes into that. And so, um, you know, a couple of things there is like, you know, when's the right time to reach out to a venture capital firm or to, to you as a partner um, or one of your associates, how do you do that? Um, you know, what's the best way to get an introduction? And then like when you're telling your story, like how aggressive should you be? You know, I mean, that's something that always comes up in terms of, you know, you know, do I be conservative or should I be shooting for the moon? You know, what, what, how do I, how do I think about that? So I know that was a lot in one question, but I'll just open it up and people have thoughts about just how should entrepreneurs who are not familiar with this whole space Think about this. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, I mean, I think it's. I think there's a couple schools of thought on when you talk to a VC for the first time. Um, and I was one who, for one of the companies I started, I never wanted to raise venture capital. Uh, so I've ironically ended up in this job. But you know, I think it's it's uh, it's it's it varies, right? You know, I think there's the risk of going too early and not having anything to talk about. And it's like, well, that was a waste of time for both sides. Um, and I would say I've always pushed historically, at least for deals we were already in, of like start the network and make sure the next round investor knows who you are and what you're going to accomplish. Um, so that when you do accomplishment and you need more money, it's not walking in cold off the street. Um, and, and I still believe in that for, you know, if you've invested in the seed or series A for the future rounds, 
with the, the big caveat that I've kind of come to the, the realization or conclusion in the last couple of years is yes, but with the, the quantity of deal flow that we're all seeing now in the, the velocity, which deals get done, like at times there's like, there's only so many meetings you can have a week and there's a right number probably, which I seem to always go over, but it's, it's, uh, at some point, it's just like, look, we can we can do our job pretty quickly and efficiently now. So while I'd love to know you, like it's got to be a pretty quick introduction versus in the past, I was much more about the networking element. Mm. Yep. <clears throat> yep. I mean, I, and so just to maybe riff on that a bit, um, you know, one of the questions was, you know, how? And I think it's it's pretty common knowledge that, you know, warm introductions are always the best. Um, there's a lot of random, uh, you know, cold call email type of stuff that's happening and a warmer, warm introduction from somebody who knows, um, you know, anybody in any uh, firm, let alone the folks on the call here, um, is always the best way to sort of pop signal above the noise that always exists there. Um, you know, I think, you know, my, my, one of my bigger pieces of advice is I think startups that, um, haven't raised funding yet, want to raise funding in the not too distant future, kind of need to have an IR perspective on how this works, right? They do need to get introduced early. Uh, they may not be ready for venture capital yet, uh, but they need to get on people's radar screens and in a lightweight way. I agree with Tom. It's actually a, um, you know, it stands out when somebody can be very concise and crisp and, and realize the stage and state that they're in, get a little feedback. And then the IR component of that, which I think is really necessary right now, is a is a lightweight you know drumbeat that the firm that the the startup can keep with their investor pool that keeps them informed that keeps them in the loop that lets them for example be preemptive if they get excited about something um, that used to be sort of the purview of later stage companies you know Series B and beyond um, yeah I think it works I think it works earlier now and I think it's important because they're you know, VCs are going to are going to get excited about, you know, portfolio synergies or going to get excited about a particular market. Or maybe there's a, a team that they can uh, they can augment in a way that uh, you know, starts to differentiate a particular deal. And I think keeping in front of those investors in a lightweight, consistent way is one of the things that I think startups should start thinking about, even at the earliest stages. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we the last several deals we've done have been companies we met early and we have our venture fellows screening those, you know, monthly updates and looking for times when it bubbles up to say, hey, should we look at this again? And we reach out to the companies, right, to check in if they hit a milestone that we think is interesting. And to Krishna's point, we might want to get in a little earlier than we normally would or at least get on the converse, you know, be back in their radar for the conversation. Um, I wanted to also say, I mean, 100 percent. A warm introduction is always the best. I will say that for women and underrepresented founders, a lot of times they don't have the same network. Um, and so we do read the cold emails, at least from a top of the funnel perspective. Um, but know that also when we get to the filtering of the companies, that's going to you know weigh in as to if they don't have the right networks and the hustle to find an intro because we're really out there and well connected and you should be able to meet someone who knows us, then are you going to have the hustle and the networks to build your business? And so we, for example, always put all the events at which we're speaking and, you know, it applies a little bit more in a physical world, but everything that we're at on our you know Twitter feed and on our website, so you can come find us. You know, you can come meet me and you can be the first person standing in line at the end of this panel, you know, if it were in real life or if it was, a, you know, with a chat to actually start the conversation and get an intro. Right. So, you know, some of this is about creativity and, um, you know, finding a way to make those connections. Krishna, I know you love the story about disco. Yeah. I, you know, well, <laughs> maybe I do. Well, disco, of course, came to us through a cold email um, and uh, we ended up uh, backing the entrepreneur, you know, single digit pre-money then to $3 billion market cap business now. So, so it does work uh, in, in some instances, the cold email to uh, ultimate glory here does happen. You know, so the way we think about it is look, you know, e either, either you follow the bucket of experienced entrepreneur, therefore people are willing to uh, underwrite and give you the, you know, m b m believe that you know what you're doing the second time around or you are an, uh, you know, you've got incredible domain in what you've done before, and therefore you are doing an extension of the domain into the new play you're doing. Um, there again, you are able to underwrite these people know uh, what they're doing, and so 
venture folks will be willing to go earlier into those kind of instances, either because of the entrepreneur's experience as a pretty impressive startup founder from before, or they just have oodles of domain uh, that that really informs what they're about to do. And of course, that was the case with Disco's case when you had a legal tech play with a, an incredibly brilliant lawyer who was starting the company with just oodles, oodles, oodles of domain there. In the, by and large, the you know the kind of companies which are people first time entrepreneur doing something that's not quite related to something that they've done in life, I think the bias would be to at least see some early evidence of product market fit. Uh, meaning, can you at least string together a couple, three customers who like what you do and have, uh, and, 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 have, and, have, and have written a check and there is some early success for the, the product delivering early value to you and so on. So that ends up being the typical motion associated with these things on uh, when venture firms typically get engaged. And of course, there's all these good practices around IR as a lifetime uh, is, is, is really important, but uh, uh, those become the typical points of intersection for institutional folks like us to engage, engage in the business. Got it. Um, another question here um, in terms of, you know, how do you, how do you choose the right partner? Um, we talked a little bit about like speed of some of these deals, right? And where sometimes um, if you're fortunate enough to have, uh, you may have four or five, six term sheets um, with folks. Uh, what's your advice to entrepreneurs on how to kind of think about firms and, and those, well, those opportunities? For sure, reference checks on us. I think sometimes people forget um, that, you know, they're a hot commodity and they want to make sure that they're also doing the due diligence on the firm they're going to select. Um, and I'm not going to be offended if you do that. I'm going to be disappointed if you don't, <laughs> because I think it's an important part of, you know, your business sort of savvy to know that you want to know who you're doing business with. So we will always make introductions to our portfolio companies, but we'd also think, you know, just like we do with reference checks, you should try to also talk to the ones we didn't put on the list uh, and, and make sure that you, you know, not just, you know, do they give a good reference, but is the style and the approach of how engaged they're going to be and, and their method of communication and sort of how much they push and what they push on matches what you're looking for and what you need, you know, to complement your skill set as a team. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to really think about. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there's, there's kind of two sides to it. I think one is, um, I think there's always a dynamic um, in a pitch and follow on conversations where, um, yeah, there's a connection, right? This is a early stage is very much a relationship game. You can't fire your investors. Um, you know, it's a, there's a dynamic that can exist within a firm, within a particular partner um, that's easy to communicate with. It's collaborative. It feels good. There's excitement. There's a feel component to it, which I think it really is material in the earliest stages because this is something that, that needs to be collaborative. And if it goes well, it really bodes well, uh, you know, for the future. Um, there's expertise, expertise within the partner, expertise within the firm uh, relative to what that company uh, is doing. And it may not be just rote market expertise. It might be how you plan on going to market. It might be the set of partners that you're trying to pull together. I think that's a really important component. And then there's a component um, that I think Carrie is kind of referring to a little bit, which is like check, check up on us. Startups tend to not either know or feel comfortable checking under the hood as much as they probably should. And, and certainly from our perspective, would be welcome to. Um, and beyond just the reference in terms of the partner and the firm and how they work and what it's like to work with them, um, there's important questions like, where, where are you in your fun life? Or, you know, how do you, what's your reserve strategy? How are you, you know, gonna make this investment and what do you typically put back? Um, you know, what, what happens after we go, you know, to the next round? Silverton's proud of the fact that, you know, on average, for every dollar we invest, you know, over five dollars at this point are invested behind us from other investors. Those questions are fair to ask. Everybody should be asking them. Everybody should talk about what that network looks like in terms of, you know, follow on investors as, as the company uh, scales. And so I do think there's a there's an ownership that startups need to have relative to their own investigation. Um, and, and I think it's fair. And that to me is a, those, those few things are very much part and parcel with how you, yeah you know, how you choose the firm, how you choose the partner, uh, and how you differentiate between, um, what is an increasingly robust, uh, financing environment. Yeah. The stupid, I, I agree with everything you both just said. The stupid analogy I always use is the average good startup lasts longer than the average marriage in America. 
So, <laughs> so you better be darn sure that you have good chemistry going into this. And by the way, you know, most marriages aren't shotgun weddings where you get married in, in less than a month, which oftentimes these relationships start in less than a month. Um, so you better do everything that Kip and Carrie just said and then some and make sure the chemistry is right and that your goals are aligned. You know, do we want to have children? Do we not want to have children? Things such as that. Like, uh, so I just, it's, it's the most, one of the most important decisions you're ever going to make. Yep. Totally. Hard to add much more to that, Eric. All right. Well, and actually we're just coming up on time here. I think we want to stay within the 45 minutes. So thank you all. Uh, really appreciated that. It was a fun conversation. I wish we could have done it in person. Hopefully we will next year. And, um, Thank you again to the folks at Capital Factory and at all the volunteers at Austin Startup Week. I know a lot goes into what you guys are doing uh, for, for the community, and so we're very appreciative of all of that. Thank you. See you Thank all. You. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Great seeing you all. Thank you.